Hey, Sterile Processing Universe. This is Bobby Parker from Beyond Clean, and you are watching Spray It, Don't Say It, how to make pre-treatment work for your OR SPD. We want to say thanks for tuning in to this 2CE event. That's right, 2.0 CEs for this event today. On today's panel discussion, we're going to be talking about the importance of point of use cleaning, laying out some key concepts for making a successful pretreatment program in your SPD and adding some practical insights to make sure that it's consistent, that it sticks, and that pretreatment works for your facility. As always, we want to hear where you're tuning in from. So down in that comment section below, let us know that information. Please drop that information in there. And without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in our panelists for today's events. All right, welcome everybody, welcome. We're gonna get things started today with some introductions. Uh, Bill, why don't you uh, why don't you start us off with an introduction here? Sure, I'm uh, Bill Filipponi. I'm the Director of Sterile Processing at North Kansas City Hospital. I've been in sterile processing about 29 years and held a variety of different roles throughout that time. Awesome, welcome, welcome. Melanie? Oh. My name is Melanie Perry. I am a OR nurse. I've been, in, I've been in the operating room for about 11 years. I've been a nurse for 20. But the operating room is my home and I love it. I've primarily been orthopedics. Um, that's my specialty. And I also work for Beyond Clean. I'm the perioperative clinical manager and I enjoy working with those guys too. Yeah, great to have you on the discussion. And I'm sure we're going to look forward to hearing some of that OR perspective as well. Yeah, it's good. Ken? Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Batten. I'm an educator at Penn State Health Sterile Processing. I've been in sterile processing for about six years now. I uh, started as a tech, worked my way up to supervisor manager, and now I hold the educator role. So I'm hoping to help everybody out today. Awesome. Welcome, Ken. And Rod. Hi, my name is Rod Parker. Good day to everyone. Um, I, I guess I have the most advantage of anyone. I'm actually retired. So you can all smile and say, you know, I don't have to worry about anything. Anyway, um, uh, the reason I'm here is I still do some consulting work uh, in my past. I, I worked uh, 18 years in pharmaceutical toxicology before transitioning to uh, Stryker, the medical device company. I was with it there for 27 years uh, and just recently retired. Uh, I've worked as all aspects of medical device developing. I, most people yell at me from the fact that if the IFUs are wrong, it's probably something I did for the instruments that I worked with. Uh, but lately I've been working as a formulator for both detergents and cleaners. So I'm here to supply the science side and my job basically is as a research scientist. So Awesome, our resident scientist for the discussion. <laughs> so thank you so much. Awesome, you all. Well, as we get started on this discussion of pretreatment, um, Let's begin with the discussion of uh, definitions. What do we mean when we say pretreatment? And uh, Rod, I guess we'll let you get started on this one. I, and I'll say it chemically. Uh, the best thing that I always talk about when we use the term pretreatment is make sure we focus on the word treat because what, what something should do in its job of a pretreatment is to make the job easier for the next stage person down in central sterile or something to be able to remove soil. It, there's all lots of different things about, you know, how it's supposed to do that. But chemically, when we make them, the job is to make sure that there's some type of treatment of the soil. Yeah, I know that's helpful. So on a practical level, then um, what we're doing with those trays, kind of the action of it. Melanie, you want to tell us what you think of when pre-treatment is said? Ideally, well, coming from the OR, and we all know that there's always um, a difference in what should be done and what really is done. But yeah. ideally, when we're in the cases, pretreatment, it's it's not just at the end of the case, spraying your instruments down and sending them down or up to sterile processing. But that pretreatment, it's from the point of use. It's like as soon as that reamer or that kerosene or whatever gets used, you're, you're wiping off the debris, you're wiping off soil, you're wiping off blood, keeping it from building up because you might do a 12 hour case. And if you don't wash your instruments at all until the end of the case, it's still dried. So that idea of pretreatment is really there to continually treat, continually use your sterile water, clean your instruments, wipe them down so that by the time you're done with your case, you have managed that debris and that soil and that blood so that when it goes to sterile processing, they're not sitting there scrubbing away, trying to really pick away things that have dried, you know, for eight, 10, 12 hours. So. 
Yeah, sure. No, that's helpful. And we'll get more into that later. Um, Ken, you want to share with us kind of your experience in SPD and pretreatment? So I've had the benefit of working at small hospitals, and now I currently work at a level one trauma center, regional area, you know. So the benefit in a small hospital pretreatment is a little different. You know, they usually don't do 12 hour cases. They're doing, <laughs> they're doing shorter cases. They're doing cases that as soon as it's done, they can get it to sterile processing. And at that point we got it clean. So the level of pretreatment isn't necessarily the same, but working in a level one trauma center now, and you're doing 12, 16 hour cases, sometimes longer, you know, these are, these are cases like Melanie said, the blood dries within the first couple hours and then they just sits there and it sits there and sits there and it's, it's detrimental to our instruments at that point and trying to clean, having to soak everything we have to do at that point, you know? So I'm, I'm hoping that this discussion can touch base with both small and large hospitals. So we can, we can hit the industry as a whole, not just a certain group. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, that's helpful. And uh, we're counting on you to bring that small facility background into that discussion. And uh, Bill, what uh, what do you what do you think of when we say pretreatment? What does that mean? Um, I think it's just you know getting those instruments ready to be processed. I mean, I think that's as we look at, at our industry um, and how instruments are handled. Um, they Melanie was correct. They have to be handled from the point of use, right? You know, if you have a short case or a long case, you need to make sure that you're handling those instruments correctly from the time that they're used. Um, it's a major commodity of a hospital, you know, instruments, there's a lot of money invested in instrumentation. So, you know, treating them correctly from the time that they're used until the time that they're reprocessed is, is definitely a key point. Yeah, absolutely. What are some other terms that get thrown around that I think people mean the same thing other than pretreatment? Can you think of any? I can give you one that that's top of my head and the one that I get the most questions on. And basically it comes down to everyone's favorite people, the joint commission um, in, in the term. And, and I know that this discussion is also supposed to talk about, uh, you know, what both Ken and Bilbo said with things about how you do things or procedures and policies. The, the question I get all the time is length of time for pretreatment or the term of uh, the term I would say is delay. Uh, because, you know, when you work, uh, as Ken said, a smaller hospital, I'll go even further to say something like an ambulatory surgery center where, you know, something is put in a container somewhere and then it's shipped to a major hospital or someplace for processing, you know, those can sit for different periods of time. So it's a different process or a different thought process. So, you know, you have, your policies should at least state some definition of, of what is considered a delay in processing mm -hmm. and what is considered routine or routine practice where you, you, that's what you do every day. And that's what the reviewer or whatever the, the joint commission reviewer is looking at to say, this is what you, you know, what you normally do. And this is what happens when you have a delay. So delay pre-treating something in, in the standards for a delay is mm -hmm. what we're really concerned about. So that term is something that you really need to to look for in your policies. Yeah. And at the end, as we get into some practical uh, suge <coughs> suggestions, <Yep. coughs> excuse me, for implementing, um, implementing policies, that'll be an important one, is defining what that delayed processing mm -hmm. looks like. Some others that come to mind for me uh, for pretreatment would be uh, pre-cleaning, hear that thrown around a lot, and then the the word that Melanie used also, uh, that point of use cleaning, cleaning at the point of use. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think these terms can be used interchangeably, pretreatment, pre-cleaning, point of use cleaning, they're all getting at the same thing, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. just, I think the important thing is, is making sure that everybody at a facility understands, yes. right, what, what those meetings are, right? Because yes, you know, as, as we look at it at, from a group of sterile processors, we understand that pretreatment and pre-cleaning is the same thing. But if I said to somebody that, you know, do you think treatment and cleaning is the same thing? Some people that are out of the sterile processing industry may mm -hmm. say, oh, we've got to clean the instruments in the operating room. So we need brushes and pans of water and like, no, that's not our expectation, right? We, that isn't what we want. So I think, I think that's what, that was the shift to the word treatment, right? Is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yeah, no, that's helpful. 
Well, that I think that also uh, you make a, a separate point that I'll make from the standpoint of endoscopes, because the standpoint is some people have specific areas that do endoscope cleaning and under the new standards with point of use for endoscopes, a little different than what you'd think from standard OR work, like Melanie said, for uh, for like an orthopedic case. Mm -hmm. it, it's still the it's still the point of use activity that you do to ensure that you're you're helping things prepared to get cleaned. So yeah, the treatments bills right. That question or that that term is much better. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as we get started into the discussion about pre-cleaning, uh, pre-treatment, point of use cleaning, whatever you want to call it, um, does it really need to be happening in the OR? Um, can't this wait until it gets to SPD? Melanie, what are your thoughts on that? Well, no, <laughs> it needs to be happening in the OR. I mean. I guess if you have like a super short case and you do like, you know, a carpal tunnel release or you do something fast and you're done, you spray your instruments with whatever enzymatic cleaner you might be having in your OR. I mean, you're still doing an initial treatment to those instruments, even when you're spraying them in the OR, but you're getting them to sterile processing. But once they get to sterile processing, they might be backlogged. It might still sit there in your case cart for who knows how long. So every, every step that we take in the OR, like I think it was Bill who said that instruments are an investment of the hospital and every step that we take protects our investment of those instruments, but it also protects our next patient. And all of us in the OR are very acutely aware of how our patients can be affected um, by anything that we do during surgery. And so we want to make sure we have clean instruments and having those instruments, keeping them clean, keeping them wiped down, following all of the um, point of use cleaning just ensures that we have good instruments that are safe and sterile for our next patient because it makes it easier for them to be clean when they get to sterile processing. Right. So I think it's it's all just a whole in tandem working together. Thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Bill, you're operating at the director level and have been in sterile processing for uh, quite a while. Um, what experience have you had in having this discussion about that partnership around the care of instruments, of getting this process done in the OR and not only in SPD? Right. It's definitely key to get buy-in from the OR. Um, there's definitely um, there's a lot that can be said about you know getting that buy-in from the the OR management and the staff um, having a good relationship with the OR management and, you know, attending OR staff meetings and educating the staff on the importance of all of these things is definitely a, a key part of that. Um, you know, one of the things that I found the easiest thing to do is just attend some staff meetings and do small presentations, right? You don't need to go in there and present for an hour and, you know, you just want everybody to be on the same page. You know, so small presentations can kind of help that help that along to get staff and everybody involved. Uh, pictures are always great, right? Everybody loves pictures. Um, you can kind of show, you know, what what the expectation is and what the expectation isn't. I think education is really what it comes down to because it really teaches staff in the OR the why behind why you're asking for this. Because what I would hear a lot when we would go through and we would talk about point of use cleaning was. Why am I doing sterile processing job? What are they here for if I'm supposed to keep everything clean? What what am I doing? I don't have time for this. You know, the, the constant litany of excuses with time being a huge one. And I understand cases are busy. I've scrubbed my fair share of them and I'm throwing instruments left and right. It is hard and it's, some, it's an extra task that does make things more difficult. But when I finally did understand, and I, I honestly think a lot of my education came from beyond clean, the more I've worked with them, but the more I understood what damage was being done to the instruments and how it could later affect other patients. My understanding and appreciation of um, point of use cleaning was really cemented in that, oh, this is very valuable. I'm not doing sterile processing job. This is our job. It's, it's a combined effort. It's not just one department or the other. Yeah, that's a very helpful, um, it's a very helpful perspective that takes a lot of work to get everybody on the same page about. You know, Bobby, I'd, I'd say if and this this often gets misinterpreted from the fact that people believe that the aspects of pretreatment or point of use cleaning, uh, you know, there's a thought that this is new, and, and yet the emphasis is new. The problem is the standards have always stated that that things are uh, the the term that was used is to wipe off gross soil in the OR. And I've been in enough a, a number of cases over the years that I've been involved with and just and and unfortunately, you know, I'm not the person that's operating. I'm I'm the idiot that stands in the back and just watches everybody do stuff. But one of those observational issues is 
you can see how things are done. And I've seen very good cases where that gross soil is removed. And I've seen cases where, you know, it just gets, no one touches it until it gets moved to a certain area in the OR perspective before anybody even looks at it. And as a formulator of pretreatments, you know, your chemistries are designed to attack soil. And if you talk about things that attack soil that's on a surface, that, that it, it's not, you're not trying to, if the, the thicker something is on a product for a chemistry, the less effective it's going to be to get to the actual soil. So removing that gross soil and being able to make it thinner in the OR so that when you apply your pretreatment product, it's able to work on the soil more effectively makes a big difference in how all these types of chemicals work. So, Yeah, no, that's a helpful comment that as we, uh, as we have this frenzy going on of everybody talking about uh, pretreatment and pre-cleaning at the infection prevention level, at, uh, at the accreditation committee level, um, it's really not a new idea. Uh, you referenced that that's always been the standard. Where are some of the places that we see written down that these are requirements? Well, mo people know that, you know, the Bible now is ST79 from mm -hmm. Amy that's in there. Um, there's a lot of, I, I've been involved with it. I can't tell you that I'm a, I'm, I can't tell you I'm a fan because I, I go back to the days when there were like 15 of the standards that we had everybody buy from Amy. And, you know, then we decided to combine them all. Uh, I was one of the advocates that sat there and said, you know, how are you going to get somebody to read a 604 page standard? Uh, because everyone I know, every, every manager that's sitting here knows that they're all, they're all, you know, highlighted and, and listed, you know, where the important points are in those, those standards that you need to look at. But, if you go back to the old ones, back in the TIR 12s, the TIR 30s, uh, that are the technical information reports that we used to work with a lot more as, as a defunct standard per se, uh, they've mentioned point of use cleaning all the way back into the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and it, it, you know, basically the point of use cleaning, meaning removing gross soil and adding things like a wet towel or keeping things moist in that regard. It's just recently that we've had a lot of the focus and emphasis on you know quite as a formulator i mean i i formulated pretreatments but it's been in it's been in the last decade it, it hasn't been like like i wasn't making them 25 years ago yeah so, on that, that note too yeah. if i can uh rod you made an awesome point i know i'm the young one of the group it seems like everybody <laughs> has 20 plus years experience and i only have six but i can tell you in that six i've worked three different hospitals uh, I've made it a point to get to know my scrubs, get to know my nurses, strictly just because it's a lot easier to tell somebody they did something wrong when you know them. <laughs> you go up to a stranger, it's kind of difficult to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I've met those scrubs who've been doing this for 20, 30 years, and you get their trays back, and they're spotless. You know, they have a basin of water sitting next to their, their table, and they clean everything. And then they get that new scrub fresh out of school and it's probably the dirtiest case you've ever seen. So I think you, you touched on it. Like there, it, it's been around for a very long time. It used to be standard practice. Everybody wiped off their instruments as they were used. And, you know, I've had, I've watched a scrub yell at a new scrub because she didn't clean them, you know? And I, I think that, that that's happening a lot too. I think we're focusing a lot on times, turnarounds, trying to speed things up and we're losing some of those old practices that have always been there. Yeah. And I, and I think when you talk about standards, you know, you have to look at it like, yes, you know, ST79 is, is the standard that everybody's following. But if you look at everything, ARON is telling the yep. same things. Yep. AST, right? AST is telling their staff, you know, the search text, the same things. Everybody's on the same page of, you know, when, when you look at, you know, what they're telling the, everybody that's going through these different different mm -hmm. roles. Um, so I think, you know, that's the thing that I always try to make sure that everybody understands is it isn't my role. It's your role. It's your role. It's everybody's role, you know, or role that that's what they need to do. So I think that's the important thing is that, you know, everybody is there. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can add one to your list, also the device IFU will often have pretreatment right. instructions in there because of the potential for damage to that instrument, the risk to the patient for cross-contamination, impeding the sterilization process. Um, everybody is uh, everybody's on the same page from the standards perspective. And so this discussion of whose job is it to, to pre-clean or clean the instruments is really, uh, really not founded. 
As we think about um, those instruments being used in the procedure, Melanie, you talked about the point of use being truly when that instrument is used and not the case um, ending. Do you have any examples for me that you want to bring to the table about um, about that type of thing, the, the fact that instruments can dry during the procedure? Have you ever seen reamers in a total hip? Have they ever come back full <laughs> of... <laughs> the, the acetabular <laughs> reamer, like yeah, the, the cheese acetabular. grater full of yeah. uh, hip tissue. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so. maybe that's the best the best one that comes to mind, you know, but, or any, when you're, you know, any of your, um, even like curettes, I mean, the little bitty ones, they can get stuff just stuck in them. And if you don't clean it out, I mean, they can, but they, it just sits there. And if you're not on top of it all, then you're turning around and then you're trying to like scrape your instrument out so you can pass it again because they need it because you didn't clean it or whatever. Um, but I've scrubbed several total hips and this is a failing of mine, I know, but I'm not the most proficient scrub. So my inexperience, I, you know, I did not keep my in my reamers clean. I didn't keep my stuff clean. And at the end of the case, trying to go through that and trying to fix it, it's too late at that point. It just, that stuff is dried and it's, it's done. And it, it's really just, it slows down so much. And especially if you're a hospital that maybe doesn't have enough trays for all of your cases for the day, and you need those trays turned over because you have another case in a couple hours that really impedes the turnover process and for getting those instruments back when you need them. So um, that's an just another reason why not letting this stuff dry is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Rod, you mentioned endoscopes. Um, yep. I know in complex procedures where multiple scopes are used, that yep. can be a challenge as well. Like when should that pretreatment be happening on those scopes? Uh, pretreatments, pre and that's when you say point of use. I mean, point of use for endoscopes is almost you know, when they get pulled out and get done. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, the issue is lumen length uh, because lumens, uh, if anybody can remember, I mean, I, I go back so many years. Um, there used to be a time when we used to flush lumens with water before steam sterilization. You did that because when a steam temperature hits a certain point in a steam sterilizer, you vaporize the water. So if you had water in a lumen and then you vaporized it, you definitely got that water to the temperature needed for sterility. That's great if you're talking about a clean, squeaky clean, all clean, fully luminescent. If, if you have something that's in there that didn't get out, uh, even if you sterilize it, you end up with, you know, we start the aspects of biofilm and the, the other questions that come with endoscopes. So that's why, you know, in endoscopic surgery, it's important to get that pretreatment done and to do something with it. Um, and and even endoscopes are even, we, we don't have to dwell on them, but I mean, it's to the point where I also look at endoscopes from the fact that the care done with those is so extremely important because you, you can damage an endoscope by over brushing it or brushing it with the wrong brush or scrap uh, what I would call scrubbing. Uh, you know, if, if you do a point of use properly with the proper endoscope with the proper equipment, it, it should only have to go down once and back and then it, it scrubs the walls because it has the proper brush length and all those kind of things. But, you know, what I've seen before is, you know, someone will say, we've had an issue with endoscopes, so we need to get them clean. Well, they'll go down on a, a moist endoscope and they'll just run the brush up and down, you know, like 90 times trying to think that they're scrubbing the dirt off. And, and the question is, are you really, you're, you're, you're taking the, the risk of the brush itself damage, damaging the inside of the scope. And if that happens, then you get places where things get, Put together so endoscopes a whole different issue um but 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 it's not any different really i, I just meant you mentioned a comment about um timing you know I, i've been in researching a long time we've we, and, and what melanie mentioned with orthopedic cases you know even on a good hip surgery uh, let's let's say a, a power tool which i'm most familiar with from some perspectives is you know if they if they zip a femur off that power tool can sit for like two hours mm -hmm before anybody even touches it. Right. And, and and even though we're talking about, well, you might wipe off the gross soil that's on the handle, but you know, power tools have so many interests. You know, you mentioned uh, the one thing I'd caution from the fact that, that acetabular reamers, the reason they don't get cleaned off is because they're really sharp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some aura people aren't necessarily uh, wanting to like try to wipe them off uh, be because they, they can cut, you know, into the gloves. So, but that said, I mean, there still should be no reason why most of this stuff doesn't get wiped away. But we know that this stuff takes time. Um, but we've we've kind of fallen, and, and we'll talk about it later. But you know, we've kind of fallen in. We've kind of fallen into the 
the, the kind of backstory of saying the, the pretreatment or chemistry is going to take care of that. And actually, it's the front end that makes all the difference. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I, Rod, you made that point earlier too. Depending on how thick the growth soil yep. is on it, you can spray it all day long, and it's just going to work on that top layer. If yep. it's if everything else is not going to be touched, and the, I tell my trainees that all the time. I said, you know, when you do your soak at the sink, make sure there's nothing on it because enzymatic has to touch metal. It, yep. don't, it doesn't need to be touching blood. It needs to be touching what we see as bare metal. Like so, you have to make sure from the very beginning we get as much of that stuff off to help our pretreatment work. Yeah. One more comment on endoscopes before we move on. Um, there's that there's that discussion about the the golden hour of cleaning opportunity for endoscopes, that one hour when cleaning ought to be getting started. But if we have a procedure with multiple scopes being used on the same patient, um, when does that hour start? Does that pretreatment and hour start when the procedure's over or when that scope comes out of the patient? I, I feel from a standpoint of mine is is that that hour starts at the time that it comes out of the patient. So if you have a scope, you know, you have a 12 hour procedure and you're going to scope in the beginning and scope at the end, you almost have to have two of the same scopes to be That's used. Awesome. Right. So you're going to pull that first scope out. You're going to be done with that. You're going to send that off to be reprocessed and have another scope to use at the end of the case because you have a scope that sits there for let's just say four hours, right? Yeah. Um, you're letting bacteria grow and then you're going to reintroduce that into the patient. Yeah, yes, it's the same bacteria you took out of that patient, right? Because it's the same patient, but now you've let that bacteria grow in that scope for four hours and now you're going to reintroduce more than actually you took out. So sure. I think it's important to say that you're using two different, two different scopes. I mean, obviously if you're using it and then using it right away and then taking it out, that's a different story. But if you're using mm -hmm. two, the same scope on a patient, you want to try to go to multiple scopes during that case. Yeah, and if you look at the manufacturers IFUs, um, I, I'm i actually having this discussion with some of my counterparts right now at work. You know, it says that the golden hour starts after point of or pre-cleaning is done, but then it says pre-cleaning should be done as soon as it's taken out of the patient. So that's, they, they put two steps in there. So if pre-cleaning is not immediately done after it's taken out of the patient, does the golden hour start you know that's where you know you have that gray area that that vagueness in the ifu that kind of causes a lot of problems yeah and ifu is being vague get out of here <laughs> no get out of here <laughs> who would do that uh, sorry about that um yeah. i could give you many reasons why some of them are vague but uh right. but we're trying to make them better no, right. we know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could mention a comment that, that Ken said, and, and but Bill emphasized as well. Um, let We make sure that when we talk about endoscopes, we, we, we talk about the bacterial contamination. But what you also have to worry about is the fact that many of these endoscopes today are so useful. I, I talk about this with duodenoscopes a lot where, you know, we could go back to five inch incisions and coming in from the outside to do, you know, gallbladder surgery, which, which has a huge infection risk rate. Whereas now when we do endoscopes by uh, an endoscope, the procedure is much less uh, intrusive to the patient, much better you know, healing perspectives. They're ex excellent scopes. Question is though, they also have a lot of more intricate parts and, and you may use one to excise tissue, then you may use the next one to clean other tissue. And then as Bill said, you pull them in and out and in and out. If you're going to go in and out, you should have a second scope or something to work with. You, you, you shouldn't be going in and out with the same scope. So, yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, just another one of those discussions that I think is often overlooked of uh, when we start that <clears throat> when we start that process for um, for counting the time for our scopes. So we've been talking uh, for the first half of our discussion here about the importance of pretreatment, um, but we've not really dug into why uh, it is important. Like, what what's the big deal with dried soil anyway? And anybody who wants to jump in, feel free to do so. There are so many so many facets of this discussion. Biofilm. I think, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, biofilm. I think the biggest thing is obviously is you know if you you. you you know, you look at something and you let something dry on there, um, you're, it's going to be harder to get off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first thing, you know, if you can see it, right, we can get it off. 
when we start talking about biofilm, we're starting to get into areas where we can't even see it with our naked eye. And then we're still leaving that on there. You know, not only is it on there, though, but it can go through that whole sterilization process and not be killed. Right. So that's yeah. that's the thing when you look at, you know, obviously, if you're just looking at a pair of scissors, right, you're going to be able to see any gross soil that's on that pair of scissors. You're going to be able to scrub it off. It's going to be harder to get off, but you're eventually you're going to get it off. Now, now you get into the, the fact of what what's on there that I can't see with my naked eye. Um, you know, and then is that going to be able to get through the sterilizer or however we sterilize that? Um, and then the next patient that uses it, is it going to fall off into the, into that patient? Right. So then when you look at why, why it's important, I think those are the key aspects of it. Yeah. That it leaves, uh, that it potentially leaves hazardous biofilms behind that we can't mm -hmm. see and what sterile processing going to do about that. Yeah. You, you, you asked the question dry, and, and dry is the soil drying. And, and Bill makes an increasingly important point in the fact that if it's blood or if it's, you know, red tissue or, or, or tissue that, that is visible, it, it's, it's very easy to blame someone for not getting that off because it's invisible. Okay. Uh, even if you think about things that are crevices and caveats, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that a number of presentations I've done, um, and maybe some of you even heard them, but you know, what, one of the things I'll tell people is, you know, how do you clean, how do you clean a flexible reamer? And people will look at me and say, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, well, if, if I'm going to write an IFU, I'm going to say, bend, soak, bend, soak, bend, soak, move, brush, flush, inspect, mm -hmm. re-soak, bend, soak, bend. Mm -hmm. soak. They're, they're very difficult pieces of equipment to clean. But visually if you can get everything off you're 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 in good steads but those devices as a lot of other devices have areas where you can't visibly see and when you dry um, if you can't visibly see it and and you have a even a pre-treatment product uh, again we're talking about treatment again you, you've got to talk about things where we're, we're into the case now with pre-treatments now where we can start to look at can those pre-treatment products get into those areas you can't see yeah. and start to work on that dried soil because that that's the parts we see now with the sophistication of complexity in devices. It's the parts that you can't see. Um, you know, I, I've been in a lot of SPDs and I've seen, I have never gone into an SPD department or an OR where the job of the person walking in saying, I'm going to mess up today. I'm not going to do my job. I'm not going to clean this today. I don't have to. I, I've been, never, ever seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, people are doing the best they can, but the, you know, you, you can only do what you can see. Mm -hmm. And that's why dried soil is so important because if you don't get to the pre-treating point to get it off and it's allowed to get to places you can't see, this is the area where we start having the most difficult process with it. It's what you can't see, maybe not bacteria from a flat surface perspective, but you know, crevices, indentations, different materials. Those are the things we really have to worry about when we're talking about pre-cleaning and and then how do we treat these things to make them better yeah all those nooks and crannies yeah. and on that point too um we keep bringing up visible bio burden that we can see you know your red tissue your blood and everything one thing i like to show my new people and i've had this question brought to me all the time or why are total knees why do they look so clean when they come back you know, they don't, they're not usually as bloody most of the time. They're not as bloody as your hips and your other mm -hmm. cases. But then I show them, I'm like, put that in water and let it soak for a little bit. And then look at the top of the water. You see that synovial fluid. You see all that fatty tissue that comes out of those bone or that comes out of the bone. And it just, it's like an oily substance. We can't see that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's an importance of pre-treatment. You know, you keep it moist. You wipe off as much as you can. It, it's you let that fatty lipid material harden it's even dip i mean if you've ever had to clean off grease that's dry you know exactly. it's difficult to clean so and that comes back you know and those those fluids get into those crevices a lot quicker than ever your tissue so yep. i think from an or's perspective uh, obviously when we open when we're setting up a, t a, mm -hmm. a, a case when we open our trays, I can see if there's still cement stuck to a freer, or I can see if there is dried bio burden on an instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't, like you said, you, you can't always see that stuff in the crevices or in the channels or in the lumens or whatever that might be lurking there. 
And then um, what what are you exposing your patient to, the next patient to, when you put that instrument in them and then something that no one could see has now contaminated them. And then maybe, I mean, for orthopedics, you know, you're dealing with bones and joints and implants, and this could have a lifetime effect on the patient from an infection standpoint that they might not ever recover from. Um, so definitely the val the understanding the importance of what you can't see is just as important as what we can see is huge. Okay. What kind of impact does this discussion around pre-cleaning and pre-treatment have on the SPD workflow? Time. I mean, it, it sounds so weird and people think, well, it takes time up in the OR. Well, you know, 30 seconds here can mean five, 10 minutes here. It can mean 20, 30 minutes there. You know, if a tray misses everything and it gets to prep and pack, if somebody does a really good inspection and they find something that was missed the past two times, now you're adding more time for that time frame. Like time plays a big factor when it comes to pretreatment. Oh, I, I give you time and, and time is probably the most valuable commodity. Mm -hmm. in, in, in decontam especially. Um, I, I have taken many people into decontam before where I take them at, you guys are going to laugh. I know you are, but I, I take them in at, you know, 8, 10 in the morning and it's go, ah, it's pretty nice in decontam. Ah, you know, it's pretty nice. You know, it, it, you know, everything's clean. Nobody's doing anything. And I said, come back at like 10, 15, you know, and they're in the first morning cases or the two cases have already started. You've got 14 case cards out, you know, it, the, the poor person working in there is just like going, okay, I've got to work. Well, they can only do so much. And the process with pretreatments and preparing devices so that they can clean them more efficiently is so important to the fact that you don't want them to not do a step because someone's asking them to go faster. Uh, you know, the, the same thing with amounts of equipment or the amount of things that you have. Uh, I was recently in a case with, you know, Da Vinci scopes where they did nine Da Vinci's and only had six trays. So when you got to, when you process those things and they take three and four hours to process, you know, the person at the two o'clock case is going, where's my scopes? And they're still in the sterilizer. You know, you're, you're like going, that's because they have to take, you know, 20 minutes in an ultrasonic, 20 minutes to soak you. The, the cleaning process is that long and that's the efficient process. So if they've got to work harder at it, th then you're just delaying everything and you don't want anybody to cut any of those to, be able to you know affect anything for the next patient. So time is we can we can show that I'll I'll start my, my soapbox speech on chemistry. We can show chemically that if you use a proper process and you use them effectively at the beginning of a case, you know, of point of use, you can indeed make the cleaning process easier, which makes the time go down. So uh, th those studies can be done. Yeah, and so with the discussion in the OR about all of the time crunches there during the case, and I don't have time to do SPD's job and things like that, is it um, is it a short-sighted comment to say those things? Like, does it does it ultimately save the OR time to not do pre-cleaning? No, it doesn't. Because no. either you don't have time to do SPD's job, quote unquote, I'm not saying that for real. Yeah. <laughs> either you don't have time to do that or you don't have time to break down a total knee and then to wait three hours for your trace to get rerun because you don't have what you need. And now your patient and your surgeon are beyond mad. Um, your schedule's delayed. And now we're working until 10 o'clock at night when we all could have gone home at seven because we had a substantial delay because our trays didn't get clean. And when all that comes down, people are really unhappy and they're really upset. But when it goes back to trays that that had some type of something left in them or left on them, and it's something that can be traced back to, well, if we were pre-cleaning, if we were keeping our instruments wiped down and we were making this process smoother from the beginning, then we could look at the, the different just multiple ways that it would affect our schedule in the long run. So I think all of us ultimately have time to be doing this because it saves all of us time in the process. Yeah. Um, and also to add to that is you think about instrument damage, if we uh, damage an instrument beyond repair because of dried soils and that instruments removed from rotation and now we have an instrument shortage on a case, then mm -hmm. that's another way that we may end up delaying or um, yeah, delaying a case in the future because of it, for sure. And I think when you look at the when you look at an OR, you know, if you have multiple ORs, you know, you're going to have people that that 
treat those instruments correctly mm -hmm. and, and meet their turnover times just fine. And then the people that are saying, hey, you know, I can't do sterile processing jobs because it's going to extend my cases. And then you say, well, but there are people in our OR that are doing that. So I think when you look at that aspect, it's an education issue, right? Because mm -hmm. why, why can one person do it and one person can't? You know, maybe they didn't have the same training. Maybe they need to be educated a little bit further um, in, in how to do it. You know, it may just be, hey, they're doing this instead of doing this and they should be doing this. Right. Um, yeah. When you look when you look at a whole OR as a whole, if you're getting some good ones and some bad ones, you know that it can be done. Yeah, especially yeah. if it's in the same kind of case. I've seen ortho right. scrub techs who can keep a total knee or total knee revision even and they can keep instruments yeah. pretty wiped down and they can stay pretty on top of it all, especially in revisions. They can get hairy. I know yep. that. But they can keep it all really under control. And then I've seen others who are like, I'm not even gonna try. This is too busy. I can't do it and I'll deal with it. And now, and the, usually the response is I'll just spray it really well when I get done and that'll take care of it. And as we've already said, just spraying big globs of goop on top of big globs of goop is not going to do anything. Well, I, I can give a little fault from the standpoint of makers of free treatment products. We have not kept up, nor have we been akin to helping application aspects for those pretreatments as fast as possible. Um, we made a lot of sprays and a lot of squirt bottles and that Melanie don't hate me, but you know, when you have to worry about people with carpal tunnel disease spraying 18,000 times with a sprayer over 14 cases, um, you know, for one kit, for one surgery, I mean, that's not an efficient way. So device manufacturers and solution manufacturers have to come up with better ways of applicating these types of pretreatments. Cause it's, it, it's, it's important from the fact that that, uh, and I'll I'll make my play for for SPD, but you know, the fingers can't always go downstairs and say there's the fault. If you got dirty instruments in the OR, look in the mirror because mm -hmm. a lot of times they started that way, and and it's not necessarily, you know, I always used to use the adage if you're pointing a finger at somebody, three of them are pointing back at you. So yeah. you got to make sure it, it's 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 a job for everyone. Yeah, it's a team discussion for sure. Yep. So uh, buckle up because what I want to uh, what I want to talk about next are is the reason why we've invited all of you to this discussion. Um, the part that takes the real experience and wisdom are uh, what practical solutions do we have for all of the problems that we've talked about, the important parts of pretreatment? What types of processes, procedures, uh, education, what solutions have you seen work to build a pretreatment process, a pretreatment policy that sticks, is consistent, and is effective? I can speak from from my standpoint, um, and you know, uh, you know, collaboration is a is a big word, right? When we look at you know writing a policy that we feel like everybody can be a part of, um, one of the things that um, is important is make sure that you have buy in from all departments and and not just department heads, right? You know, as as a director, I can write a policy. I know how to write a policy. Um, I can get the director of the OR to agree to that policy. It's getting that buy-in from the staff. that And that staff is the OR staff and the SPD staff, right? You want everybody to be involved um, in that policy when you're kind of starting from the beginning. Um, you know, taking it to um, staff meetings or um, unit-based councils where you have, you know, the staff that are running meetings and, and you know, introducing it there. Um, education, obviously, is another key part of that. You know, and, you know, I always tell people that an education isn't one PowerPoint at one meeting and, you know, hope everybody understands it. And I'll shoot it out in an email to everybody. It's a it's a it's an education that lasts for years. Right. Because yeah. you're going to have turnover. You're going to have new staff. You know, so if you you know go to a staff meeting, and you present that, you know, maybe, you know, six months from now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to present the same thing. And, and the OR staff are going to be like, ah, we saw this six months ago, but there are some people in that group that didn't see it, right? And don't know that our hospital places a huge emphasis on this. That's no, helpful. Yeah, I think prior prioritizing that relationship and that collaboration and then prioritizing um, just the importance of, of everyone doing this. And it might even this, it might take, you know, those few scrub techs who are adamant, let, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. It might take an attitude adjustment on their part to really 
have that discussion like, no, this is something we pro we think is important. This is something we're going to do. And what can we do to help you so that you can be more efficient or so that you can you can participate in this with us? Because you don't want that attitude being passed on to anybody else that they may train when you bring in a new scrub tech or circulator who might be scrubbing. Um, so you want to have that buy-in, I guess, and that, that ownership uh, from your staff that this is what we do and this is important. And like you said, having that education and that bringing the SPD and OR together so they're not separate, but we're together. And this is something we all think is something that we should be doing. Sure. Definitely. And I, I'll touch, I mean, we're all going to probably say the same thing, collaboration and education. That's the two biggest points. You know, policies and procedures are already in place. Standards are in place. Everything's there. But being able to talk as an SPD to your OR or as an OR to your SPD, you know, being able to understand why we're doing that, that's the importance. And, and having that relationship to be able to go talk to the staff, to be able to go talk to them, you know, and if you're doing the in-services, change it up a little bit, you know, something, just having that collaboration, having that relationship is absolutely vital for trying to get this kind of stuff done. It really is. And and I'll, I'll chime in on the fact that uh, I can do this now because I'm not working for a company. Um, I would challenge, I will tell you right now that there, it, Pre-treatment came as a pre-treatment perspective, and all of a sudden, a number of products were developed. Mm -hmm. You need to understand the chemistries and the importance of what those products do. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, the, you know, like the, the comment from the standards say to keep things moist and keep things moist. And a lot of times, like I know the Joint Commission folks will ask for a length of time. It's always been my contention is that, you know, why is it or when is it a good idea to keep metal moist for a long time? time. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking many, many, many hours, uh, two, three days, and people say, well, how do you get to two, three days? And it's like, well, simple. Somebody from an investigative perspective asks you, you know, do you ever have a case on Friday that doesn't get done till Monday? Well, then all of your stuff has to have some process to be able to be done for, you know, over the weekend processing. And it's like, that's why the procedures are so important to say, this is what a delay is, and this is how we handle that. That's not what we do every day. And, and that way you don't get caught in that, that you're following your procedures and the Joint Commission has to look at what your procedures say. But what I would task folks in Central Sterile and the OR is when you're sold a pretreatment product, you ask two important questions. One is, what does this stuff do? No, you know, does it, does it cover stuff up? Does it, does it, you know, what does it do? And two, how does this product help me clean the devices off? If it does nothing more, like there's a couple things, like a, humidif a, humidif a humidification chamber is a very good thing for AS, you know, ASC's uh, ambulatory surgery centers that send something in where you put it in a humidification case, you keep it kind of moist and you transport it in a humid, humid environment, it stays moist. That, that's just moisture, that, that's water. That's like a paper, uh, paper that's like a huck towel over a, over a case. With, with water. If you're using a chemical, the chemical needs to do something. If that chemical helps you clean, it's helping everyone. If that chemical just basically, you know, takes the place of a humidification chamber and basically covers stuff up, then it's, it's doing the same job, but it's not helping you get any clean. So you have to really like, what is it supposed to, you know, what does it do and how does it help me? You know, that, that's, you know, any supplier of those devices should, or those products should be able to tell you the chemistry and the, uh, you know, the working ability of how they do that. Yeah, that's think, a helpful call out. Yeah, go ahead, Millie. Um, just one more thing to go really from the OR, to really help the OR when it comes to um, understanding the value of this is bring in the chemical guy. Bring in the pre-treatment enzymatic spray person, not to just do an in-service for sterile processing, but let them talk to the OR. Let them talk about how their product works to the OR staff. But then also when you're talking about all the different requirements and regulations for point of use cleaning, my, I mean, my OR director or when I was the manager of my OR, I could do all of that. I mean, I could do the education, but really having the sterile processing director or the sterile processing manager or somebody from sterile processing who knows this stuff in and out 
to come and do that education and do the teaching, it really just crosses those lines a little bit more to blend us into this one team that we really are and lets the expert be there doing the education and not just um, one of us passing on what we've been told. But then there's also room for OR to ask questions and to really clear up any misunderstandings. And I think that's a really helpful way to really ensure that the OR understands the importance of what they need to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, having somebody there who can really tell the story uh, mm -hmm. is, is important. Yeah, I would say find that person because you all get sold most of these from a salesperson. Um, I'll tell you, that's not probably the person. Uh, it, it, <laughs> at, at, at my old company at Stryker, I, I used to just cringe at the amount of people that would say, you know, we have to we have to clone me or find more rods um, because I was that person. Uh, but there, every company has that person or that bunch of people. Just keep asking till you find that person and you get somebody who actually understands what they're telling you. Um, the rep will tell you everything that the company is supposed to give to the folks for the marketing side of it. But if you want the details, you know, keep asking them to connect you to somebody else. So, yeah, no, that's helpful. Thinking particularly and in, in, in diving down on the policies portion of this question, are there any uh, particular policies, competencies, orientation materials that you found to be helpful and effective? Rod mentioned clearly defining what a delay is and when we're going to start that pretreatment process. Uh, we talked about some of the fuzzy um, questions around uh, the timing of when pretreatment starts, particularly on endoscopes that people could be confused about. Are there any areas like that or policies like that that you've seen be effective in, in clarifying for your staff what needs to happen? I don't write the policies, so that, <laughs> I, I can't say yeah. that. So, so I guess I, I can speak a little bit to that, to that point. Is is it's just it's just making sure to be clear of everything, right? You know, when you when you know a lot of times you know, people when people write a policy, they try to be a little bit vague. They may say, "Hey, reference the IFU." Right, yeah. and that's really not a policy, right? We, right, because we all read the IFUs, we all know the IFUs, um, but you know, having those defined things into that um, policy, like like Rod said, you know, maybe defining the word delay, like what is a delay? Maybe defining, you know, the the hardest thing to define because I just did a um, education on pre cleaning maybe about six seven months ago as try to define the word gross soil yeah. because everybody has a different definition of gross soil right? Everybody thinks that may be something different. So having that definition in a policy so that everybody at your facility understands what you mean by gross soil, you know, because what, what gross soil means to me in sterile processing, I can tell you means something completely different to somebody else um, that's not in sterile processing. Um, so I think yeah. making sure that your policy is, um, you know, you, you define the terms that you want everybody to understand. Yeah, Bill, that's so helpful. And having a, a readable procedure where somebody could follow it who, you know, didn't know how to do it, they could walk through that step of procedures and know how to how to pretreat that those instruments is important. In my experience in hospitals, the OR is not SPD's only customer, but we've got instruments scattered in clinics all yep. around the facility. Yep. And so, um, we're expecting dozens or hundreds of people to be able to speak to our pre-cleaning policy, to be able to perform that for a surveyor. And if we just have one training uh, with a big, you know, kickoff event with the um, with the expert from the enzymatic spray company come in and say at one time, there's no way that three years from now that somebody up in wound care is going to be able to speak to that. So having an annual competency with a standard procedure that's clearly defined find um, is really the way to go if you want it to stick and be consistent. Yeah. I, I would say that I, I would I would emphasize what Bill just said. Uh, one of the things I see missing in a lot of policies is a definition. Um, I can tell you in the standards world, we can waste hours, you know, figuring out the, the meaning of the word of or, you know, so I mean, it, they're, they're silly, but it's so important that when you write one of those things that are that are inclusive of what you're supposed to do, especially in a regulated area. 
the, the, being able to point to a definition, uh, and I, I'll, I'll say the word delay only because the Joint Commission tends to focus on this a lot because it's in the standard. And you say, if you have it defined, uh, that you don't necessarily, you know, like I would define it, you know, as a time per se, you know, and it, it um, plus or minus, because a lot of us will say, you know, our, our, our delays are anything more than four hours. You know, it's like, well, what if it's four hours and five minutes? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that, that's a, that's a deviation from your policy. Well, you know, you'd give yourself a little bit, you know, you know, with, when, within a you know time of a, you know, four hours plus or minus 30 minutes. So, you know, but, but that's what you can point to when someone says, are you following what you're doing? Instead of just saying, uh, like Bill said, you know, remove gross soil. It's like gross soil is this and we're going to remove it, you know, so it doesn't meet that definition. You might not remove it all. You might not get all of it, but it, at least you meet your definition. And it's so important. Yeah, that's really helpful. I'd like to finish up our conversation today uh, talking about how we're going to sustain change and how we sustain the effective pretreatment of devices um, and how we measure that. So what role can auditing play as a leader, as a technician, as an educator? What role can auditing play in the pretreatment process to make sure we're achieving best practice? I think ultimately, Auditing, while I think a lot of times it scares people and makes staff nervous, it doesn't have to. It doesn't just because I show up to check your back table or show up to check your case cart when you're done. It doesn't mean that I'm out to get you in trouble, um, but it does provide an opportunity for education. It provides an opportunity for explaining, well, this is really what we're looking for. Our policy really says that we need to be doing this. Um, and then here's here's what we need. And then what do you need from us? Is there something that we can do to help you? Is there more you know training or anything you don't understand? Um, but it can definitely be it can definitely be beneficial. It doesn't have to just be, mm -hmm. oh, your case part was dirty. You're getting written up. I mean, but it, we don't have to do it that way. We can make it a way an opportunity for improvement if we're watching and seeing what's going on. Yeah, and as leadership, you have to tell them you know tell them the good and tell them the bad. You mm -hmm. know, that, exactly. that's when you if you get a trade downstairs in SPD and you're doing a spray audit and make sure everything's good and everything's great and it comes down good, tell the OR, hey, we just got a cart. Absolutely amazing. Great yeah. job. Uh, that's, that's what we want to see because it's that positive affirmation. Like you're telling mm -hmm. them, hey, good job. Do that again. That's what we want. They know what you want. Okay, that's what I need from that case going forward. You know, is it going to happen every time? Probably not, but they know. Okay, yeah, that one case I did that one day, that's what they want. Yeah. And it and it gives you evidence too. you know, the you know, the first couple of months, you're not going to have a lot. But however long you do it, you have that evidence. The SPD can go to the OR and say, hey, you know, out of this many cases, this many were sprayed, this many weren't sprayed. We got damage from this many. And you it, it shows hard evidence. Sometimes people just want to see numbers. Yeah. I mean, you give them numbers and they're like, OK, well, maybe out of those 40 trays that weren't sprayed or cleaned, maybe I was four of them. You know, that's. However, you know, and that that does help people quite a bit when you do auditing. Yeah, and you can do usage rates as well. And one of the things I find out is somebody will buy a pretreatment and then they won't order for three and a half months. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, and I've gone into ORs before where I've you know I've picked up a pretreatment bottle off of a uh, outside an OR and it's still full, and I go, well, they must have just replaced it. And it's like, well, they haven't ordered anything and you know, like too much. So, so yeah, you could say, you know, on a given rate, we should be going through this much material. So material management people could just say, yeah, yeah, we, we, you know, we're consistently ordering. At least that what that means is it may not mean that you're actually spraying trays appropriately or you're getting them all done, but it means you're at least using what you should be using, you know, at a given rate. So that kind of helps a little bit, but I like what, what Ken said about, you know, I've seen many times when you open a case cart and, you know, how many of the trays are treated, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I think when you look at, you know, your SPD staff in the decontamination room, you know, it's hard to get them to oh, yeah. stop working and find a supervisor, lead tech director to say, hey, this wasn't done right, mm -hmm. you know, and then they got to wait for you to come in and take your pictures or do whatever you have to do. Building that building that that team cohesiveness that you can actually have that tech in the decontamination room, you know, they get a cart and it's bad. They call the OR, that OR, 
you know, scrub tech runs right down and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was wrong. You know, you know, and just having that ability to have that teamwork where you have that, you don't need to find that person. You can find, you just call the OR room and tell them, Hey, this is, this was sent down. It wasn't sprayed. Mm-hmm. You know, it was covered in gross soil, whatever, whatever the case may be. And having that teamwork where it's not taken as, Hey, you're putting me down, but Hey, you know, you know, and that, that OR tech might say, Hey, look, you know, this is what happened. You know, we had this happen, we had that happen, and that's what why that happened, right? And, and then that Deacon Tam person knows that, oh, okay, but we just can't have that happen again. Okay, fine, right? You know, having the ability, giving your your team the ability to to communicate is is definitely part of it too. Definitely. Yeah, that's really helpful, Bill. And I uh, I've found it to be true um the old saying that what doesn't get measured doesn't improve and so um having uh having some way both as a technician and and as a leader to be able to capture some of those uh some of those hits and misses and present that information and get everybody on the same uh the same page of pushing towards a goal is really what it takes to start having some success in this area um so we are at the top of the hour so panelists i want to say thank you so much for joining this uh fantastic conversation i thought that we brought out some really interesting aspects of pre-treatment. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to our terrific audience today for your participation in the comment section. Um, we appreciate you for uh, for tuning in. I also want to say thank you to the sponsor of our event today, Striker. And as you've been watching this, don't forget to grab your CE credits for today's presentation. It'll, there'll be a link in the comment section down below. And thanks so much for spending your time with us today. And, uh, and until next time, we invite you to keep fighting dirty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.